Hello again, this is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to the Archaeology of Shavuot, Pentecost, Lesson 2. And before we start, I highly recommend that you listen to Lesson 1, entitled The Archaeology of Shavuot or Pentecost First. It will set the foundation for this lesson and also for lesson number three. So I strongly urge you to listen to lesson number one before you go into lesson number two uh, so that things uh, become clear uh, here in lesson two. Second of, late, second of all, before we begin, I wanted to thank many of you for your generous donations to Light of Menorah. Uh, I it was just amazing. So thank you so much. Some of you donated online. Some of you actually uh, know the post office box address for Light of Menorah. And you sent in some great donation donations. And thank you so much. We rely on you to keep us going. There's nobody here at Light of Menorah that makes a salary. So uh, it's not for anybody's personal gain or whatever. It is part of Light of Menorah. This is what we do. So thank you so much. If you would like to donate to Light of Menorah and the work that we do, go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org. Light of Menorah, all one word, Light of Menorah. Menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H, M-E-N-O-R-A-H. And so it's www.lightofmenorah.org. And off on the right-hand side, you'll see a place to donate. And you can click on that to donate online, or you can actually write down the address, mailing address for Light of Menorah, and actually send in your donation uh, by mail. And so that's there on the website uh, for you. Uh, a third thing that I wanted to bring up uh, before we begin is that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are disciples of Adonai Yeshua in Hebrew. So not only are we disciples, but we have to make disciples. We have been given work to do. Now you'll remember in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul is teaching. And he says, For by grace you have been saved, not of yourselves, because it's a gift from God, and not as a result of works, so it's not anything that we can do so that anyone can boast. So we are God's workmanship, God's workmanship, created for good works, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So grace, we have been saved by grace, nothing we can do to earn our salvation, quite definitely. But God says we're his workmanship. And he's given us good works. Now, when we actually take a look at the Hebrew, uh, the Greek word there, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 for works, it's ergon. The Strong's number is G2041. And going to Thayer's Greek lexicon, you have to use a lexicon to really understand the conceptual meaning of the Greek word being used here. The word ergon, works, really has... The conceptual meaning of an occupation, of a job, your employment, your profession, or your business. So God is giving us an occupation. God is giving us a job. And these works are not necessarily, some, we, sometimes we Christians think about God has given us works to do. Uh, Jesus said, we'll do greater works. And so all of a sudden we're going to think, oh, we're going to be raising the dead and doing miracles like Jesus. Uh, th this has got nothing to do with that. You'll see that in this session and the next session. It has everything to do with an occupation, a profession, a business. And what's our occupation? We're disciples. So every one of us has our kingdom card, our business card in the kingdom of the Lord. And we've got our name out there. And uh, Sam Smith or uh, Mary Jones. And after that, you've got your title, Disciple of Messiah. So we want to be disciples and we have to go make disciples. This is a command by Jesus himself. So it's my prayer here in this third part before we start 
it's my prayer that these podcasts uh, might be useful as a blessing for you uh, as you do your work in order to go out and make disciples. And so I hope they are a blessing. I hope you'll able to be share, share them with others. I hope it, it encourages them in their faith to walk in a deeper way with Jesus. And don't forget our Facebook page. It's a new way to connect many across the world. So let's join as one and let's all walk deeper in a more passionate way with him. Okay, so let's begin lesson two. And I have a very unique way of starting lesson two. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, Shavuot, Pentecost. Now, the reason why I started that way, in lesson one, we talked about that Jesus ascended to the Father 40 days after his resurrection, and it happened to be the 40th day of the Omer count. So you have to listen to lesson one to go into that deeper. And Omer basically is a Hebrew word for a sheaf of grain. A sheaf of grain is just a bunch of grain, uh, usually a big bunch tied together with ropes or whatever. And Jesus rises from the dead on the Feast of Bikarim. And so if you listen to Lesson 1, go into that detail. And the Feast of Bikarim was a special feast, probably was on Sunday in 30 AD, in Jesus' day. And it was the beginning of the barley harvest. It was the first harvest in the spring. Now, they're harvesting barley to make bread. Bread was the staple of life in Jesus' day. Bread was the food of life. And Jesus says he is the bread of life, and he rises from the dead on the Feast of Bikarim. The first fruits of those who are rise, going to rise from the dead, as, as Paul teaches. And he does this on the Feast of Bikarim. And all along with that, in the Bible, it talks about the fact that God says, start counting on this day, that Sunday, Count seven full Sabbath weeks, 49 days, and on the 50th day will be the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost as we know it. Shavuot is weeks, seven weeks, seven Sabbath weeks, to be counted seven Sabbaths, or Pentecost, day 50. So you've got the Hebrew and you've got the Greek. So Jesus, on the 40th day after his resurrection, which is the 40th day of the Omer, because Jewish people count down each and every day with a set of prayers and blessings. So he actually rises back to the Father, ascends to the Father, on the 40th day of the Omer. And there's a, a bigger biblical meaning here. 40 has the, uh, you might say, Hebraic symbolism of a complete process like 40 weeks in the womb. When a woman is pregnant and she's going to have a child, the average time that she's carrying the baby from conception to birth is 40 weeks. A complete process. <clears throat> you talked about the fact that the flood, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, the Hebrews were in the Sinai wilderness for 40 years. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. That number 40 represents a complete, a complete process. So we have a picture. Jesus rises or ascends to the Father on the 40th day of the Omer. And all the Jews would understand that the new grain, the barley, has just been harvested. It's the bread of life. But Jesus, the bread of life, he ascends to the Father on the 40th day of the Omer. You can see my article that I've provided on the website. So if you go to the website, www.lightamenorah.org, and you are looking for this session's description, in that description, before you click on the place where you listen to the actual podcast, you'll see a link for my article on the Feast of Bikarim, the Feast of the Omer, the Countdown, uh, and how that relates to Jesus' ascension. 
And again, I also recommend that you're listening, you should listen to lesson one of the archaeology of Shavuot, the archaeology of Pentecost first, because it sets a more detailed understanding that indeed Jesus' ascension is connected to the Pentecost. So if Jesus ascends to the Father on day 40, there's 10 days left before Pentecost. It's the countdown to Shavuot. Now you understand why I started with 10, 9, 8, 7. There's 10 days left from his ascension. Now Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, one place in the Bible that we can read about is Leviticus 23, starting in verses 15. And I'll read from 15 through 21. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf, there's the word sheaf in Hebrew, omer, when you brought in the omer or the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. Along with the bread, you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, one year old, for a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priest. On the same day you shall make a proclamation as well. You are to have a holy convocation. In Hebrew that's mikra hakodesh. Holy Convocation. In other words, supposed to have a service. You're supposed to have a gathering. And you shall do no laborious work. It is to be a perpetual statute in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. So that is one place where we read about the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost. And another place that I want to uh, talk about is Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. Because here's another verse in Deuteronomy that's related to this. And we read, Three times in a year your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover, and at the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and at the Feast of Booths, tabernacle, Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So what we have here is we have the description of the God's feast, the Lord's feast of Shavuot, and the requirement in the Torah, God said, all your males, every man must appear before me at the place I designate. Now we have three awesome ancient sources to study the feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. One of them is the ancient Greek philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher, the ancient Jewish philosopher, uh, Philo, also Josephus, and also the Talmud. The Talmud is both the Jerusalem and the Babylonian Talmud were basically commentaries on the Torah that were finished uh, roughly 500 AD. And they are great sources to actually uh, determine what were the rituals, uh, what were the things being done uh, in Jesus' day. Because the Talmud does talk about that in the days of the temple. We know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the second temple. But here the Talmud is describing what those details were. I also link you to uh, a Jewish website called the Temple Institute. And I linked you to, the, they have a great tutorial. Just awesome. Uh, which takes the Talmud, Josephus, Philo, brings that all together in a tutorial about what happened on Shavuot in Jesus' day. 
and uh, the te the Temple Institute bases it on those ancient sources. So I've got that link. So if you that that's just another great resource uh, with regards to your uh, deeper study on this feast. Now, in review of what the Temple Institute actually is presenting. The people, realizing that the 50th day is approaching, they started all over Israel gathering together and gathering their first fruits uh, in baskets, putting them together. So I would imagine maybe they had barley loaves they put together, bread that they made. Uh, maybe they had grapes. Grapes were already coming in season for the making of wine and fruit juice and so on. And as they gathered together soon, their families and friends would... Uh, gather together and form caravans to travel from uh, the remote places of Israel, sometimes even the remote places of the world, Turkey and Greece and Rome, Egypt. They travel in caravans, especially in Israel, only for the simple reason this is protection. Right? You do not travel alone on roads uh, in Israel during those days because they were dangerous. That's why it seems that Jesus, when he, uh, when Mary and Joseph were coming from Nazareth to Bethlehem when Mary was pregnant, uh, it is more than likely they did not travel alone. It was probably the time during the feast that they were traveling. Now, during Shavuot, the people then gathered just outside the city of Jerusalem before the 50th day. They would camp out. And on the early, early morning when it's still dark, on day 50, all of the pilgrims, because this is one of what you would call one of the pilgrimage feasts, thousands upon thousands of them would enter Jerusalem for the various entrances into the temple area. They would be singing. This is in the uh, Jerusalem Talmud, in the chapter that you would call Bikarim, chapter 3, verse 5. And in the Talmud, it says that people would be entering Jerusalem singing, I was happy when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Not the temple of the Lord. God of the Bible does not have a temple. He has a house. That's what it was called in the Bible. So this gigantic parade would enter the temple, was led by an ox that had its horns painted gold. This is the bull, you would say, that is going to be one of the 24 animals sacrificed. Now, the night before Shavuot, in the temple, the Levitical priest would get together and take wheat, and they would start making those two leaven loaves of bread, because this was part of the sacrifice and ritual that God even ordained uh, that we read about in Leviticus 23. Now, why leavened bread? This is the first time that we're reading about bread that's leavened. We'll get to that in the next lesson, in lesson three. We'll focus in on that. Because every other feast, they're using unleavened bread, especially like in Passover. On the day of Passover, you have the lambs are slain uh, on Passover. Sundown comes, and then it's the first day of unleavened bread. That would be the evening when the Jewish people would have their Passover meal. And they had unleavened bread. So unleavened bread was a big deal in all of God's feasts, except for Shavuot. And like I said, we'll talk about that later. So we're back to that early, early morning, and the people are all coming in on the Feast of, uh, uh, the feast of Pentecost, Shavuot. There were the sacrifices, and along with the sacrifices, there were the lifting of the leavened bread, two gigantic loaves before the Lord. Now, one thing I want you to remember, and you can study this on your own. Uh, this is in Exodus 29, starting verse 39. Exodus 29, starting in verse 39. God said and ordered his people to sacrifice two one-year-old male lambs every day. One in the morning at the third hour, and one in the evening at the ninth hour. The third hour is roughly 9 a.m. And the uh, ninth hour is roughly about 3 in the afternoon. Now the sacrifices of Shavuot, they were done in the morning as part of or including the daily morning sacrifice. 
that was just commanded in Exodus 29. We just talked about that. So they would have the sacrifices. They'd be lifting up the unleavened bread. They would have to do the sacrifice um, of that one-year-old male lamb because this has to be done each and every day forever. All of this was followed by the morning prayers at about nine-ish in the morning. And Jewish people had their morning prayers and their evening prayers uh, in the temple. So, for Shavuot, this is the time of the second temple, everybody is at the temple. And the temple was called a house. In Hebrew, you can actually read it because the temple was called Beit Hamikdash. And Beit is house, Hamikdash, holy dwelling place. This is the holy dwelling house of God. The streets in the city especially in the upper city, probably probably were mostly deserted. Because again, as we read in Deuteronomy 16, 16, all the males, all the men must be appear before Adonai in his house. This is the place that he designated. Now that's kind of a review of the material that you would find at the Temple Institute. Like I said, uh, that link I provided in the description of this session at the website, uh, it's fun to go through because they have wonderful pictures, wonderful way to go through to understand what was going on in Jesus' day. Now I did this because we're going to ask the question that when we read Acts chapter 2, and Acts chapter 2 is the place where we read about that Pentecost that Feast of Shavuot, where we would say the church began, the birthday of the church. Now, the Jewish people were practicing Shavuot many years before that, many years after. But it just so happens that was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Where did it occur? Now, in Acts chapter 2, the first thing we need to realize is there is no mention in Acts chapter 2 that the disciples, the 120, were in the upper room. The word upper room appears nowhere in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 2, we're reading about the events of Shavuot. We're reading about those amazing events when the Holy Spirit descended upon the 120 disciples. And when we're reading in Acts 2, verse 2, it says the whole house was filled with the mighty wind house. Wait a minute. The Jewish people don't call the temple the temple. I heard one rabbi who said, the Greeks have temples, our God has a house. It was called the Beit HaMikdash, God's house. In Jesus' day, the temple was called the house of God. It was never called the temple. You can read in 1 Kings chapter 5-8. through 8, Solomon is commanded by God, by God, and God says, I want you to build me a house. God never says that to Solomon, I want you to build me a temple. We call it a temple, as it has been translated into English. But it's never the temple. Matter of fact, all those chapters, chapters 5 through 8, even into 9, Solomon is building God's house. Now in Acts 2, verse 2, we're using the word house, and it's likely, therefore, that the 120 disciples were in the temple. It's Shavuot. They're religious Jews. Everybody is at the temple. Mighty wind filled their whole house and the place that they were at. Where was the place that they were at on Shavuot? Obviously, the temple. In Luke 24, in verse 53, one of the things that we read is, after the ascension... After the 40th day of the Omer, the 120 disciples of Jesus, it says that they were in the temple courts daily, continually praising God. They weren't afraid anymore. I've heard it taught that, oh yes, uh, the Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2 happened in the upper room. And like I said, upper room doesn't even appear uh, in Greek anywhere in Acts chapter 2. And I've heard it taught that all the disciples were in the upper room cowering of fear. Were they fearful? Yes. 
in John 20, verse 19, it says they were afraid. That was immediately after the crucifixion. But after the ascension, everything changed. They weren't afraid anymore. And they were in the temple continually every day praising God. So why wouldn't they be in the temple on Shavuot praising God? In Acts chapter 2, verse 5, it talks about Jews from all over the world. Why? It's a pilgrimage fest. So you have thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the world coming to Jerusalem. They're not in the city. Now it's about 9 a.m. They're there at the morning sacrifice. They're there at the morning prayers. They're there because of the Shavuot sacrifices. And all of this ends about 9 a.m. It happens, it ends basically about the third hour or in that time period of the third hour. We remember in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 13, <laughs> the disciples are speaking in tongues. And all of these religious Jews and Gentiles, they were religious Gentiles there, god fears, and they were hearing these 120 disciples talking in their own language. And they started saying, these guys are drunk. They're drunk on sweet wine. And Peter says, no, they're not. It's only the third hour. Nobody gets drunk at that, that time in the morning. It's the third hour. It's 9 a.m. Where is there going to be such a large crowd from all over the world at 9 o'clock in the morning or the third hour? It's the Beit Hamikdash. It's the house of the Lord. It's the temple. In Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Peter in his speech, he's talking and he refers to David's tomb that it's right here. Now, if David, I mean, if Peter is in the temple, maybe even on the grand staircase on the southern steps, David was buried just south of the temple, just outside the city of David. Now, the city of David was really only a small city at the time when David actually became king. And at that time, that was called Mount Zion. Now, it's very fascinating from an archaeological point of view, from a historical point of view. This is verified one scholar after another, and I will be, again, linking you to some articles about Mount Zion. Mount Zion, in David's day, was considered the hill, the mountain, where his city, the city of Jerusalem back then was located, and Solomon's temple. It's just one mountain. That was called Mount Zion. Later on, it's considered all of Jerusalem, and then even after that, it's considered the western hill. Jerusalem is built on two hills, the western hill and the eastern hill. Today, if you went to the eastern hill, this is where the temple mount is. Uh, this is where you would see the walls that Herod built uh, of the temple uh, platform itself. That's the eastern hill. That used to be called Mount Zion. And it's actually called Mount Zion in the Bible. Uh, check out that link that I provided. You can actually read those verses in the Bible where the temple mount is called Mount Zion. However, it changed. In the Middle Ages, the Jewish people started coming back to Jerusalem. And when they started coming back to Jerusalem, they assumed that Mount Zion was the western hill because in basically Hezekiah's day and after Jerusalem, the city actually started spreading up to the western hill. And so they would read and say, well, David is buried in the city of David on Mount Zion. So therefore they think that David's tomb is on Mount Zion, the western hill. It's not. He was buried in the city of Jerusalem the city of David, which was located on the eastern hill. Now in Acts 2, verse 41, we talk about 3,000 people were baptized. Now the Greek word there is batizo. Batizo does not mean baptized. It means to dip, to immerse, to wash, to bathe. So if you took a shower this morning, Guess what? You did baptizo. You, <laughs> you did an immersion of, of water. 
So taking a shower is being baptized from a Greek point of view. Uh, jumping into a lake where you're really getting wet is being baptized uh, in the lake. So when they were, when 3,000 people were doing an act of batizo, they were being immersed. They were Jewish. So they were immersed in a mikvah. A mikvah is basically a Jewish ritual immersion pool. You actually immerse yourself in a mikvah. So, and there were hundreds and hundreds of mikvahot, these Jewish immersion pools, all around the temple. Because many people would actually immerse themselves for various reasons before they entered the temple. And one of the reasons why is it must be non-cistern water. So all the mikvahot, all of the baptismal pools, uh, ritual immersion pools, uh, fit the rabbinical laws about being non-cistern water. So the only place to immerse, baptize 3,000 people is near the temple. There's hundreds of mikvahot. So the events of Acts chapter 2 happen at Beit HaMikdash Adonai, the holy dwelling place of the Lord. It happened on the mountain of the Lord. Go to Isaiah 2, verse 3. We see that the mountain of the Lord moves. <laughs> it used to be at Sinai. And now we have a new location according to the book of Isaiah, verse 3. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up. This is important. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So indeed, what do we read about in Isaiah 2, verse 3? You go up the mountain, the mountain of the Lord, and when you get to the top of the mountain of the Lord, what's there? God's house. The Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2 happened on the mountain of the Lord. It never happened in the upper room. There was hardly anyone in the cities, only very few. Like we said, there were very few immersion pools, maybe a few in the houses up there among the rich people. But 3,000 were baptized. And with all the immersion pools that were there, there were hundreds. 120 disciples could probably baptize 3,000 people who wanted to be immersed in less than an hour. Now the disciples, they're not fearful anymore after the ascension. The Bible's very clear. They were fearful the day after the resurrection, but not after the ascension. So again, we have to ask, why did it happen in God's house? Is there something we can't see? It's like Jesus' Jesus' ascension on the 40th day. Yes, the Bible is clear. Luke gives us clear information that it was the 40th day after Jesus' resurrection. But there's more. Because for the Jews, 2,000 years ago was the 40th day of the Omer. There were 10 more days. They were counting down to Shavuot. Something big was happening. There's the connection between Passover and Pentecost, between the Passover and Shavuot. One was the first harvest, harvest of the barley wheat or the barley grain. And Shavuot is the harvest of the wheat. So, in the podcast, The Archaeology of Passover in Lesson 3, or in the archaeology of Shavuot Pentecost in Lesson 1, it's clear. God is trying to show us that there's a connection between Passover and Pentecost. They are related. We have the first harvest at Passover. We have the final harvest of grain at Pentecost. So how is all of this connected to the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, how is the coming of the Holy Spirit upon all of us related to Passover? How is the Passover in Exodus related to Pentecost? Again, 
Let us walk with those first Messianic Jews. We did now. And the archaeology and the history show us clear that that Pentecost happened at the temple. It had to. And when we walk those streets, those ancient streets of Jerusalem with those first believers, and to try to understand what they saw, try to understand what they heard, try to understand what they understood, our view of Pentecost is deepened and enhanced and enriched. So what are those connections? Why did God have the events of Pentecost happen at God's house on the mountain of the Lord? What's the connection? Watch for all of this in Lesson 3 on the archaeology of Shavuot, the archaeology of Pentecost. Shalom. Shalom.